Hello, my name is Roger Gitonga. Uh, I'll be taking you chapter through chapter four, which is known as the microeconomic factors. Before we start, I want us to understand that this area is usually considered one of the toughest in F1 accountant in business. But you will actually realize that it is not as tough as most students put it. And I'll make sure of it that you are able to understand it and at the same time digest every important bit of this chapter. Now in this chapter, we're going to be looking at three things, demand, supply, and competition. Demand is the quantity of a good or service that potential purchasers would be willing and able to buy or attempt to buy at any possible price. Now, I love the, two diff the, the word willing and able because you find that many of us are willing to buy something that we love, but we're not actually able. So if you're not able, then you, you're not put in the bracket of uh, a demand schedule. You know, you do not create demand for a product because you're not actually able to buy it. Now, demand actually reduces as the price increase. If a price of a specific good increases, then you will not demand for it as much as you would have if it was at a lower price. Then the third point we say here, that changes in the demand curve caused by price change are actually represented by a shift or movement along the demand curve from one point to another. Now, what this actually means is I want us to look at this graph here. You realize that at P0, we are demanding for quantity zero. But as we reduce our price to P1, we actually demand for more. If you realize Q1 is actually more than Q0. Now, but what did you realize here? The, the price change could actually be represented by the shift along the curve. So you realize that at P0, we are supplying at Q, we are demanding for Q0. But as we, as the price goes down, we demand for more. So you can realize that shift, that shift along or that movement along the demand curve. Price elasticity of demand. Now, one thing I want us to understand here is this is actually one of the areas, okay, or is actually the only area in F1 that will involve calculations. What is price elasticity of demand? Now, I want us to imagine this. We already said that demand will ideally increase if the price reduced. Now, you realize that that responsiveness, okay, that responsiveness, the way the demand responds to the price is what you call elasticity. If you find a good actually responding in the way it should. Like, for instance, we've already given the example that demand will increase if the price goes down. Then that and a good actually responds in that manner that the demand of a certain good has increased because its price has gone down. Then we consider that good to be elastic. Okay, so that is what price elasticity of demand is. Now. We say here that if we measure the responsiveness of demand to a change in price at one particular point in the demand curve, then that is known as a point elasticity of demand. Now, this is how you get the uh, equation for point um, elasticity of demand. We realize that we have the percentage change in quantity demanded over the percentage change in price. Now, if you're measuring the responsiveness of demand to a large change in price, we can measure elasticity between two points on the demand curve. And this is what you call arc elasticity of demand. Now, the difference between the two is that with the point, you're focusing at only one particular point, but with the arc, we're focusing between two points. So you have to find the range between the two points, and usually we find the average. And we're going to see how you're going to compute that in our next slide. Now, when the price elasticity of demand is greater than one, then the demand is elastic or responds well with price. Now we have a question here and we are going to be computing point elasticity of demand in this question. We say that the question says that the price of a good is $1.2 per unit and the annual demand is 800,000. Now market research indicates that an increase in price of 10 cents per unit will result in a fall in annual demand for the good of 70,000 units. Calculate the elasticity of demand at the current price of $1.2. Now, the question here is looking at the point elasticity of demand because it's focusing at a specific point, which is 
dollars. Now, how do we compute this? We remember that the equation, if I can take you back, is percentage change in quantity demanded over percentage change in price. So we want to know what is the change in the quantity that was demanded? What was the percentage change in the quantity demanded over the percentage change in price? Now, what we see here, the percentage change in demand is 70,000. Now, 70,000 is ideally the change that occurred because you realize that the demand fell by 70,000 units. So that is the change over 800,000, the original demand, okay, uh, times 100%. So you realize that the, the, the fall is 8.75%. Okay, then the percentage change in price is 10 cents. Now, 10 cents was ideally the increase that occurred. That was a change in price, a 10 cents increase. Okay, over 120 cents. Now, I do 120 cents because you realize we had $1.2, and if you convert $1.2 into cents, you multiply it by that by 100 and get 120 cents. So we get 8.33% rise. Now, the PED at price 1.2 is the change in demand over the percentage change in price and we get 1.05 which means that this good is elastic now at elasticity of demand we have the same question by the way no change whatsoever but the key thing here is that we say what is the price elasticity of demand measuring the responsiveness of demand over this range now if you ever see this word over this range then they're asking you um for the arc elasticity of demand now the difference between arc and point is in the computation if you look at it carefully in the previous one we had 70,000 over 800,000 but with this one we have sorry we have 70,000 over 765,000 now what is why are we doing 765,000 why are we using this now we're using this average because if you're asked of the elasticity of demand of our range. Now, how would you be able to get the elasticity of demand between two points? You'd find the average, isn't it? So we are getting the average here. We first get the change. The change is 70,000, but it's going to be over the average of the difference. Now, the difference is 800,000 plus 730,000. Now, you might be asking yourself, why did I get 730,000? Now, you remember that the demand fell by 70,000. So the next point would be 730,000. So we'll get that by taking 800,000 minus 70,000 to get 730,000. So those are the two points, 730,000 and 800,000. Add them both and get their average. So you divide that by two and you get 765,000. And you will then get the percentage change in demand. It's the same thing for price, get the average here. Uh, put it over the change and get the percentage change in price. Then get the arc elasticity of demand where you get the percentage change in demand over the percentage change in price. And we can see that that good is also elastic under arc elasticity of demand. Now, income elasticity of demand in simplicity basically means that we expect that the more money we have, the more income we have, the more we'll demand of a product. If my salary increases by double, I'll buy more products. I'll demand for more products. Maybe I was buying two kgs of sugar and I'll buy five because I have more money. So you realize that you will take the percentage change in quantity demanded over the percentage change in income. If you realize between price elasticity of demand and income elasticity of demand, one of the key things is that the percentage change in quantity demanded is always the numerator, while the, the, the income elasticity or the price elasticity is the denominator. Now, goods whose income elasticity is positive are normal goods like basic foodstuffs. Now, this basically means that the more income you have, the more you buy of those basic foodstuffs, isn't it? The more you demand for those basic foodstuffs. But if income elasticity is negative, it is known as an inferior good since demand for it falls as income increases. Now, I'll give you a good example here. Buses are cheap, but as your income increases, you'll actually prefer to travel by air, isn't it? So you realize that you have more income, but you're demanding less for the buses, okay? And you're demanding more for air travel, something luxury, luxurious. Now, cross elasticity of demand is where you realize cross elasticity occurs when 
you realize that the price of one good is being affected by the demand of another or the demand of one good is being affected by the price of another good now we look at we look at here mostly we, we focus mostly on complements and substitute goods because a substitute good is a good that is an alternative to another like tea and coffee but complements are those ones that are bought together okay or are used together like cups and saucers bread and butter and the likes so you you realize that if i for instance demand for more tea if, if the price of tea increases i might demand for coffee isn't it because maybe i do not want to buy tea because the price has increased so you realize that for substitute goods uh, the value could be positive. Now we say positive, or if it's a perfect substitute, it might be plus one. Now I've not given an example of a perfect substitute because we do not have any, we don't have perfect things in this world. But you realize it's plus one because if the price of, let's say for instance, if the price of tea increases, right, we expect the demand for coffee to increase as well, right? So they might, if they are perfect, then that means that they increased at the same rate which will give you a positive one. But naturally speaking, they don't usually increase at the same rate. You might realize that even if the price of tea has increased by 10, 10, by $10, then we do not ideally expect the demand for coffee to increase by 10 as well, okay? 10 units or 10 kgs or the likes. You might expect maybe a lower or a higher uh, quantity demanded. Well, with complements, what happens here is that if, let's say, for instance, the price of bread increases, then that means that we will stop buying, we won't buy a lot of bread, and hence we won't buy a lot of butter. So you realize if the price of bread increases, then the demand for butter will decrease, and hence it gives you a negative. Now, unrelated products are the ones that have no relation whatsoever to each other, like bread and cars. Now, shifts of the demand curve. A shift tends to occur when at the same price, you might be demanding more or less of the same product. Now, this can be caused by a rise in household income. For instance, if you're earning more, you rather you would buy more of that good or demand more of that good, even if it is at the same price. A rise in price of substitute goods, you realize here that if, let's say, for instance, tea, Again, if the price of tea increases, the demand of coffee will increase. So you realize that coffee does not necessarily have to change its price, but the demand for coffee will increase because the price of tea has increased. While you will also find that maybe a change in tastes towards this product. If you love the product more, you might demand more for it, even if it's at the same price. If the population increases, it means more people will be demanding more for that product. Now, a supply schedule, basically the curve of a supply schedule slopes from left to right. It's the opposite of a demand schedule. Now, I don't want you to ever confuse between supply and demand because you'll find here that suppliers aim to maximize their profits and hence they will supply at a high price. I have found um, this issue with students where they usually debate and they say, come on, if you supply more at a high price and there'll be no demand. But you see here, you're not focusing on demand, we're focusing on supply. So you realize that for demand, obviously customers would want to buy at a lower price, but for suppliers, you need to think, when you think about, when you're dealing with a supply schedule, you have to think like a supplier that you want, you rather supply at a higher price because that means you'll get more profits okay now the different things that can influence the supply quantity be it the cost of making the good expectations of price changes where you might expect that maybe in the future the price might go high, higher so you don't supply much now you might supply much later uh, within with the introduction of technology you realize that technology makes your production processes more efficient and hence you reduce on costs now shifts now we might have a rightward shift or a leftward shift, okay? So a rightward shift basically means that you're, you're supplying more but at the same price. Now this would be caused maybe because your cost of production have reduced. So if they've reduced, you can supply more because you will be making more profits. Maybe the fall in price of other goods may result to a supplier shifting production of another good that is more attractive and higher in price. Like for instance, if you are a supplier of batteries, you know, who uses batteries now? <laughs> so you might shift to something else that might be more promising. Now, technological progress as well. We discussed this previously that technology brings more efficient 
such uh, production processes and hence reduces your cost and means that you might also produce more and supply more. Now, a left out shift basically means that at the same price, okay, you are dem you are supplying less. Now, this would be caused by an increase in the cost of production because you realize if the cost of production have increased, then they're going to affect your profits. A change in the taste of customers, if they don't like what you're supplying, then that means you might supply less. And then indirect taxes like VAT or value-added tax might also affect your supply. Now, the equilibrium price is where demand is equal to supply. If you look at my diagram there, you realize that at $1.4 is the price at which a the, the customer is willing to buy it, but at the same time, it's also the price at which the, the supplier is willing to supply it. So we at $1.4, we have no surplus or shortage in the market. But if at $1.8, you realize that that is very high, it's above what a, a customer is willing to buy at. So you find that the customer will might not, ideally, if you look at the demand curve that slopes down, the customer at 1.8 will demand for 500. But the supply, because you're a supplier, you want to make profits, you'll supply at around 690 or thereabouts. So what do you realize here? You supply more than the demand, so you have an excess supply. With $1.2, you as the customer might be very happy and you might demand for 700 units. But the supplier might not be as may not be too happy and might supply at a less price at around 550. So you realize that there's an excess demand. Or even a shortage, because with a shortage, that basically means that we don't have enough to meet the, the demands of, of the customers. Now, maximum prices or price ceiling, I want you to understand this. Maximum prices are there to encourage demand. And if they're there to encourage demand, then that it, it basically tells suppliers that, listen, hey, you can't charge this much. You can't charge above the equilibrium price because you want to encourage demand. So for instance, if they want to encourage the demand for flour, let's say the equilibrium price is $100 for one packet of flour. Then they will say, we want to encourage people to buy more flour. So we'll put the maximum price at $80. And that basically means that suppliers cannot supply um, beyond okay, or above $80. So you realize that the demand will be a lot, but the supply will be less. Now, what happens there? We'll have excess demand. Now, if we have excess demand, one thing that you will realize, like look at this here. P1 is the equilibrium price, okay? But the maximum price is below the equilibrium price because you want to encourage demand. You want to encourage your customers to buy. So what happens here is that you realize that there will be the demand will be quite high at Q2, but the supply will be low at Q3. Now, you realize that there's a shortage out here of the products. So customers will be trying to look for this product, but they can't. So what happens here? You tend to form a black market because now customers are there, they're willing and able to buy, but they have nowhere to buy. So they now find a black market. But in the black market, because the good is in scarcity, it's rare in supply, they will sell at a higher price, which is at P2. So the common question here is usually which type of, of, of policy by the government might uh, bring about a black market. You should always know that it is the maximum price. Now, the minimum price, which is also known as a price ceiling, aims to at least encourage more supply. And hence, you'll find it above the equilibrium price because that means that if it's above the equilibrium price, it will be at a very high price. And that means that suppliers will be so happy to supply this price because they're making profits. But the demand... Uh, or rather the customers will not be too happy to buy at this high price and hence you realize that an excess supply. Now types of competitions, we have perfect, monopoly, oligopoly and monopolistic. Now I want you to ask to understand this. First of all, we have nothing like perfect in this world. So, but what characterizes a perfect market. Now, the first thing here is that suppliers produce the same products. At the same time, the market is very easy to enter and to exit. And everyone actually has a perfect knowledge of the market. That means that both customers and suppliers know what is the price 
they they know how far they can go in terms of bargaining and they know what is the best price for them and hence you realize that the price is usually at equilibrium and the demand curve is horizontal which means that it is perfectly elastic now a monopoly the word mono means one that means that you're the only one controlling the whole market now we find that in most countries the companies that distribute power or electricity are monopoly companies no one else might be distributing electricity in that country so you find that most country companies that are found under this um uh, type uh, are basically regulated or controlled because so they don't get super normal or super abnormal profits now oligopoly now this arises where a market has few dominant producers okay uh, if an oligopoly has only two firms, it is referred to as duopoly. The word duo means two. So you realize, I'll give an example here of Coca-Cola and Pepsi because they're the dominant producers in their market. Okay, and they're the, the only two, so they're known as a duopoly. Now, they're often characterized by complex product differentiation, which basically means that I really need to understand what would make me love Coca-Cola more than Pepsi. Okay, what would be the difference? Now you realize that maybe the taste is different. Maybe you love the taste of Coca-Cola more than Pepsi. And maybe that taste is only char characterized or is changed by a simple chemi chemical or the likes. Then monopolistic. This arises where the market or when the market comprises many producers who tend to use product differentiation to distinguish themselves from others. I don't confuse monopolistic and monopoly. Monopolistic, a good example is the phone industry. You realize that there are so many phone manu manufacturers. We have iPhone, we have Nokia, we have Samsung, we have Siemens, we have no uh, Motorola, we have, you know, we have so many, you know, Oppo, depending on the country, you could even be having more, like the Blackberry and the likes. So how would I know that maybe a Nokia is better than a Samsung? What would I be looking at? I look at what features do they have okay is the camera better does it have better software you know uh, stuff like that so how is the processor what is the ram you know so you look at very many things that might differentiate different products okay anyway thank you so much for listening to me i hope that this chapter has now been made much easier and uh, i wish you the very best thank you